What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Thursday, May 2nd, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, Total Energies considers moving stock listing to New York over favorable oil and gas views from the Twilight Zone. Absolutely unbelievable story. We will then kick over and cover when worlds collide, U.S. Gulf Coast refiners face challenges to assessing heavier crude oil. Um, that'll wrap up our news segment. We will then pop over and cover all things finance first. Talk about what Jerome Powell specifically mentioned um, in relates to where interest rates are going, which played a huge role on the absolute pounding that crude oil prices got today. We also saw a large EIA crude oil inventory build, which did not help uh, prices either, mainly the reason we were down so much today. Um, we will then kick over and quickly cover um, some specific earnings. We saw Chesapeake and Diamondback come in today, and I, I think there's some interesting um, notes on both of them relative, so we will cover all that. And a bag of chips, guys. As always, check us out. World's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com. I am Michael Tanner, in for Stuart Turley, who is on assignment. Um, I'll be holding it down today solo. He'll be back in the chair with me on uh, Monday uh, after the weekly recap. So let's go ahead and kick this off. Total Energies considers moving stock listing to New York over favorable oil and gas views in the U.S., Absolutely right. Somebody is moving to New York City to get better oil and gas laws. Well, well, I'll read straight from the article here. This is Bloomberg. Um, Total Energies is increasingly making noise about moving its stock listing to New York, adding much more chatter around European giants potentially being attracted to the U.S. investors. Greater enthusiasm from oil and gas companies. Holy smokes. Would not have said that two years ago. Next up, uh, next paragraph. The French giant is considering switching in part because ESG... And this is a quote, in part because ESG policies in Europe have more weight, according to Chief Executive Officer uh, Patrick Poignang. He told the, uh, the, the French Senate, he, I mean, you're telling the French Senate this unbelievable uh, on climate change goals, uh, quote, we're losing European shareholders while U.S. investors are still buying the stock. He did say that the company will, quote, seriously study such a step and prevent its findings to the board in September. That was uh, based on his conference call last week with analysts. I mean, this is causing a lot of shakeup right now. We already know that Glencore is trying to do a coal merger or a acquisition of a coal uh, a spinoff, and that is being looked at very badly upon the London Stock Exchange. They're considering moving all of their operations over to the United States. It's pretty unbelievable. Here's Eric Meyer, head of RBC Capital Markets in France. We love these guys. Uh, Europe's uh, virtuous attitude when it comes to ESG norms, free traders say uh, – or say on pay may have been naive at times in front of trading partners, but economic interests above all. It's a good point. If, 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 and again, for as much as we complain about what's going on here in the United States, you also have to look at, it's a lot tougher to do business over there in, in, um, in Europe, we know that Shell is also possibly considering doing this, and especially as we've seen prices continue to rise relative to where they are now, um, or relative to where they have been, excuse me, I think you know more and more people are going to see this, but we could see Total Energies um, move out of France and come over here to the U.S. It would be, would be really interesting. Um, they're saying all options are on the table. Um, you know, that, you know, to give you guys a quick idea, Total Energies um, is valued at about eight times earnings, whereas um, um, Exxon is about 12 times earnings. So there is a, a little bit of a valuation difference there. Does it have to do with where they're listed? Who knows? All right, let's move to the next one here. When worlds collide, U.S. Gulf Coast refiners faces challenges to assessing heavier crude. This is a little bit of in the weeds, but since I've got the solo show today, I've got the keys to the kingdom. I wanted to bring this up. Refi we talk a lot on the show about refining margins, and I talk about that relative to when the EIA um, – Releases all their info. I I I, I tech. I, I I like to uh, look at the supply. We bring it up every once in a while in terms of what's going in and out of the refineries from a utilization standpoint. But there also is something to refineries refineries being able to handle a certain type of crude, specifically heavier crude. Obviously, you can have an idea. West Texas Intermediate, which is the standard oil price 
oil composition that, that people base everything off of. We've heard of that. You can imagine that is almost green looking. It's a vial. It's very easily poured in. It's definitely a little bit see-through if you only have a little bit of two. That's that light, sweet crude. What comes up from Mexico, what comes up from Venezuela, what comes from Russia is really a heavy crude, which is almost could be considered more of a paste. Now, heavier crude has a lot of impurities in it, which cause it to trade at a um, discount relative to the light sweet crew. But what it also requires is different retrofitting on the refineries. And because of some of the stuff that's happened in Mexico, specifically over their future forecasted supply of oil, it's it's kind of thrown some of these refineries into, into whack here. So I'm going to go ahead and read a few uh, a couple paragraphs out of here. The prospect of decreased crude oil supplies from Mexico, the top international supplier um, to the U.S. Gulf Coast, is creating uncertainty among heavy crude-focused refineries. Mexico's state-owned country, Pemex, or Petro um, Pemex, instructed its training unit, unit to cancel 436,000 barrels a day of crude exports for April and to sign, uh, and to supposedly focus on producing domestic oil at its new... Uh, or processing the domestic oil at its new 340,000 barrel per day dose Bacchus refinery and or existing plants. While this refinery startup is not nearly as imminent as Pemex says, the cancellation of Mexican crude imports could be problematic for U.S. refiners with plants built to run heavy crude, a necessary ingredient to optimize operations and yield. Adding to this complexity of the situation is the upcoming startup of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion and recent reinstatement of U.S. sanctions on Venezuelan crude. Um, and this is, from, uh, you know, they go on to examine sort of the potential fallout from this decision from Pemex in terms of where those heavy crudes were going. Specifically, the heavy crude is going to be less and less available. So they it's a really great overview. I'd recommend going to Energy Newsbeat and reading this. Um, uh, Andy, if you can go ahead here and pull up figure one, the typical qualities of Pemex crude oils, you're going to see the different grades there. Olmec, Ismus, Maya, and Altirmo. Notice that Maya is their uh, flagship grade. Basically, um, it's the majority of their um, exports are specifically coming in that Maya flagship blend. The interesting part is that that Maya crude blend does definitely have a little bit of a smaller gravity. You see the API gravity of the Altamira is a little bit lower, sitting at 15 and a half, whereas the Maya is about 20 or 21 to 20. Um, with this restriction in Mexico now sending their a lot of their domestic heavy crude to within, um, with all of this crude from Mexico now and Pemex staying within Mexico, it goes to wonder where are these U.S. Gulf Coast refineries going to find their heavy crude? We also know Venezuela is, is, is the, the sanctions are ramping back up. People have, you know, we, we, we drew a little bit of oil. There was a few loads coming out of Venezuela, but now the prospects per se of a lot more oil coming out of Venezuela is not going to happen. So a lot of what these Gulf Coast refineries are dealing with right now and what this analysis shows is it tries to plant out where exactly are these going um, to come from. And and the big, the big, big answer um, specifically in this article, as I mentioned, was that Trans Mountain Pipeline, which flows from Edmonton all the way down to British Columbia and the Puget Sound system, where there are a bunch of refineries. Canada also has a decent amount of heavy crude. So if we have to now shift ourselves and buying it from Canada, those differentials are a little bit different. You pay a little bit more of a premium for the Canadian heavy crude than you would the Mexican heavy crude. So all of a sudden now the spreads on what a refinery can make or not, it, it could go down. And specifically, if you're talking about, you know, the margin that makes up the refining basis, it could get very interesting here. I love this breakdown, you know, via RB. RBN Energy, we do a lot of it, that stuff. You know, it's a $25 billion investment, that Trans Mountain Pipeline. So whether or not that's going to be able to completely take over or not, it's it's going to be interesting. You know, the, this article goes on to say, to the extent at which an individual refinery can lighten up its crude slate by very vari uh, varies by site, switching to lighter crudes would increase costs, given that light crude is more expensive than heavy crude. However, the light heavy crude differential continues to narrow and may narrow further on the U.S., on the U.S. Gulf Coast, as measured by West Texas Intermediate spread to Houston. 
you know, these nar- these narrower differentials are expected to incentivize some Gulf Coast refiners to shift towards lighter crude slates. Further, we expect the minimal impact of crude runs and increase in Latin America imports, um, or they they see minimal impact to overall crude runs and some increases to Latin American imports um, to the United States Gulf, excluding Venezuela. So it looks like they're thinking a lot of this is going to come from, from uh, Latin America, Canada, and be able to fill the gap. But very interesting what Mexico um, has decided to do, and it kind of gives you a little bit of behind the scenes on a lot of what these um, refineries are dealing with on the back end. So we'll go ahead and jump over to the finance segment, guys. But before we do that, as always, uh, the news and analysis you just heard is brought to you by um, wor- the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Um, appreciate Stu and the team doing a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. You can hit the description below for all of the timestamps, links to the articles. Um, appreciate all the f- uh, uh, feedback and support. Um, you can also check us out, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. As always, energynewsbeat.com, world's greatest website. Let's flip over to finance here, guys. I mean, a pretty, pretty tough day for the markets. Markets were up in the morning. Jerome Powell decided to come out and give a little bit of a crazy, sp- not a crazy speech, but a little bit of a dampening speech on the market. And markets absolutely tumbled, finished actually down on the day after being up almost 85 points on the on the, on the Nasdaq or excuse me on the S&P 500 we've now fallen um, about 75 points uh, market closed at about 5018 that's about three quarters of a percentage point down uh, Nasdaq was down about 0.7 percentage points uh, 10 year yields uh, or two year yields fall 1.45 percentage points 10 year yields fall only 1 percentage points dollar index down about uh, 3 tenths of a percentage point um uh, Bitcoin down 5% uh, below 60000 at 57000 And then we get to crude oil, who dropped about $3.33 today to seventy nine seventeen as we currently sit here and stand, which is uh, lower than we've seen it. And, you know, I think there's, there's two reasons why the overall markets have done pretty poorly today. Obviously, um, the FOMC, you know, they, they meet today. The... Um, you know, they 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 held its benchmark interest rates at its current level. You know, we, we kind of all thought that, you know, we know they have priced in a few rate cuts. But based on some of the, the info that's come out, the FOMC decided to keep interest rates um, where they are in that 5.25 guidance range. Um, you know, Jerome Powell always decides to speak afterwards. And and basically his quote was they're prepared to maintain the current target range for the federal funds as long as a appropriate. Um, they also said they would slow the pace of reducing its balance sheet starting in June. Um, that decision ensures money markets don't experience an episode of volatility and stress as seen in September 2019. So interest rates from the federal funds stay the same, which means you know overall markets are going to take a little bit of a hit relative to the fact that we were hoping for some rate cuts coming in. And you can see the broader markets didn't like that. You know, another reason oil prices were down, as I mentioned, 79.16 was the fact that we did have crude oil inventories come out today. EIA estimated a 7.3 million barrel build for the street for uh, the crude oil inventory reserves. That compares to a 6.4 million barrel draw. Last week, we saw gasoline um, uh, inventories rise by 300,000 barrels, in which we saw a draw of 600,000 barrels yesterday. Gasoline production was about 9.4 million barrels daily, which compared to um, one, uh, 9.1 million barrels during the previous week. Distillates, we saw a draw of the inventory, about 700,000 barrels, um, with production on those distillates adding about 4.5 million barrels per day. So, I mean, uh, you know, there was... I, 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 we're swinging on crude oil inventories. And if Stu was on here, he'd say, hey, maybe we need to check the numbers a little bit. I won't necessarily go that far, but I do think, you know, these wild swings we're experiencing on the on the crude oil inventories front is indicative of that the, the market may not be as solid as we think. And and, and as we kind of swing back and forth, it, it, it continues to hurt. Two earnings I want to cover, uh, Chesapeake and Diamondback. We'll start with Chesapeake. Um, you know, this is going to be a bloodbath per usual or not per usual, but clearly because of the fact that, that we're leasing earnings here in, in Q1. Um, you know, we, we've got a couple different things here. Uh, net cash provided by operating activities um, for Chesapeake came in at a cool $552 million. They delivered about $112 million of adjusted free cash flow. Um, 
you know, did a quarterly combined base and variable dividend of about 71 cents per common shareholder, um, reaffirmed its car, uh, borrowing credit base um, to about $2.5 billion, um, uh, to about $2.5 billion. Um, and um, that variable breaks down into a variable dividend of 14 cents and a base dividend of about 57 cents. You know, here's here's the, the the other interesting part. As I mentioned, net income was only 26 million or adjusted net income about 80 million. Um, obviously, the street didn't like this. You know, you 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 miss on earnings. You know, they're down about 20 percent or, you know, the, a slight miss on earnings. You know, 56 cents a share street was averaging about was hoping for about 70 cents a share. So not quite, unfortunately, what the street was wanting. Their stock today was trading down. Let me pull it up here. Um Stock down was 3.5 percentage points um, on the fact that natural gas prices actually rose today a little bit. Or, uh, you know, uh, uh, not rose, but they they out uh, lost natural gas. Natural gas dropped 2.8 percentage points. Chesapeake now down 3.8 percentage points. So a full percentage points increase on the downside, mainly because, I mean, the market, I think, is is adjusting the fact that if, if prices don't turn around, it's going to be tough tough for Chesapeake and these companies uh, to keep making money. You know, they, they, they're, they, they talk about how they're building their productive capacity with over 46 ducks and, and, and keep deferring what they would call turn it TILs or turning lines, which means, Hey, who knows what's going to happen? Uh, we're just going to wait and see, and we're going to plug and we're going to turn these guys on, but we can turn them on. So, uh, you know, not good on Chesapeake side. I do want to point out that, I mean, they're still spending money, folks. It's $354 million of CapEx being spent in Q1. What they're spending CapEx on, I have no idea. I don't know what you'd be spending CapEx on in this environment, but hey, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. They are drilling, you know, you know, there's no Eagle Ford. They're just drilling Hainesville and Marcellus um, relative to uh, um, um, what, they, well, what they're saying. So it's really 300 of, of, of CapEx. There's non-drilling, you know, field and corporate capex that could technically be associated with it but they're still finding ways to spend money folks and i think the street is going to somehow figure out and it's going to come to them at some point and say okay guys what's 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 going on here what what's going on here? why are we spending 300 million dollars when gas prices are below two dollars but that's just me look at diamondback real quick i mean they're only down you know just just to give you guys a a, a quick thing they're only down 2.5 percentage points oil's down 3.5 percentage points so they're actually saw a little bit less of a drop relative to what oil prices did mainly because of their um impending merger with endeavor resources um they're still hoping that gets approved here quarter four of 2024. Um, but to give you guys an idea, net cash provided by operating activities, 1.3 billion operating cash flow before working capital changes. You know, that's a mouthful right there was 1.4 billion. CapEx was still 609 million free cash flow, um, 791 million uh, base dividend of about 90 cents per share and a variable dividend of about one point one dollar and seven cents, um, which means it's about a basically a two dollar um, um, per, per share, he, uh, or excuse me, about $2 per share. And that implies, um, a 3.8 annualized return or, or a, a 3.8 annualized yield, uh, based on that closing price, about $205. So absolutely, uh, uh, good stuff for Diamondback. I mean, they continue to, to 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 keep on keeping on. They went ahead and drilled uh, seventy nine wells, sixty nine in the Midland Basin, ten in the um uh, ten in the Delaware Basin, and completed one hundred and one wells. Uh, there, it's a pretty big rig program. Um, I don't know exactly how many, uh, but we can give. We do know that they're they completed thirty lower Sprayberry wells, nine nineteen Wolf Camp A, sixteen Joe Mill wells, fifteen Wolf Camp B, twelve Middle Sprayberry, six Wolf Camp D wells, and three upper sprayberry well so they continue continue to 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 chunk along they they also did release some of their guidance you can go check out i mean we 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 are big fans of diamondback here on the show um they you know we always say good management good numbers the team over there uh continues to make smart acquisitions i think this merger with endeavor is only gonna to make them stronger and i think that's partly what you're seeing in this um in this in this earnings recall in terms of you know where they came in relative to how far their stock fell relative to where oil prices fall so um great day all around guys it's the end of the week though so i'm gonna go ahead and let you guys get out of here appreciate for checking us out um world's greatest website www.energynewsbeat.com you'll see a a long form interview with with Stu tomorrow on conversations with Stu energy you will see our weekly recap on saturday and we will be back in the chair monday for everyone uh we will see you have a great weekend we'll see you monday
Thank you.